In a couple of other lectures, I pointed out what the number of textual variants are, which is somewhere in the range of about 400,000 variants for all of our New Testament manuscripts and versions and fathers of the New Testament. And I also gave another lecture in which I discussed the nature of these variants. Now, the nature of the variants I broke down into four different categories, but what's most important for us to consider here is that last category, those textual variants that are both meaningful and viable. By meaningful, we mean that it does change the meaning of the text to some degree, and viable means that it has a good possibility of representing the original text of the New Testament. That constitutes, that category constitutes far less than 1% of all New Testament textual variants. If there's about 400,000, that means that we're dealing with less than 4,000 textual variants, far less than 4,000 textual variants that are both meaningful and viable. And this is where all the debates about the significance of these variants comes in. So when someone hears that there's hundreds of thousands of textual variants for the New Testament manuscripts, often they make an equation between those variants and the original text to such a degree they say we have no idea what the original new testament actually taught both historians and people who are christians people of the faith uh, are obviously going to have some vested interest in this whole issue now when it comes to those that are both meaningful and viable one of the most remarkable things is that there seems to be no cardinal doctrine of christians that is impacted by these viable variants. In other words, what is impacted are things that are more peripheral as to uh, what their beliefs are. Uh, for example, uh, the Christian faith historically, going through the first seven creeds and beyond that, uh, embraced the virgin birth of Christ, they embraced the deity of Christ, the Trinity, uh, that uh, Jesus bodily rose from the dead, uh, th those kinds of things. All of that is completely intact in these textual variants because none of those teachings of the New Testament is impacted by any of the viable variants. Now, to be sure, there are gonna be verses here and there that uh, John 1.18 in one set of manuscripts seems not to affirm the deity of Christ, while in another set, it seems to affirm the deity of Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16 in one group of manuscripts says who was manifest in the flesh, and another group says God was manifest in the flesh, both of them referring to Jesus. One of them seems to be an explicit affirmation of the deity of Christ, while the other one does not. That's certainly true on that level, but that doesn't mean that overall the New Testament text is uh, altered significantly to change uh, one of these beliefs. In other words, if someone didn't have 1 Timothy 3.16, he'd have plenty of other verses that the New Testament seems to affirm the deity of Christ. Same thing with the resurrection of Christ. Mark's gospel, I believe, ended originally at uh, verse 8 of chapter 16. There you have Jesus appearing to the angels and telling the angels that they need to talk to these women and that he'll meet his disciples in Galilee. And so the angels tell the women that Jesus is not here, he's risen, he's gone on ahead of you to Galilee. So the women get an angelic testimony that Jesus is raised from the dead, but there is no appearance by Jesus in Mark's gospel of his resurrection. Some would want to turn that into saying Mark's gospel therefore does not affirm the resurrection of Christ, which really is nonsense. It's not, a, not even a careful reading of the text. Mark's gospel, of course, affirms the deity of Christ, but the question is, does Mark have any appearances by the risen Christ to his disciples? And in the original form of gospel, uh, Mark's gospel, I would say, no, it does not. There are two passages in particular where there's quite a bit of emotional baggage attached to the text. There are only two texts in the New Testament where we have more than a couple of verses that are either added or deleted by any major group of manuscripts, and especially those that have made it into uh, translations. We're talking about Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, and John chapter 7, verses 53 through 811. These two passages are 12 verses each, while as the next largest one to add or lack uh, material is two verses, and we only have about two dozen places where there's one or two verses that are added or deleted depending on what the manuscript testimony says. Those two patches, uh, passages then make a quantum leap six times the size of the next largest passage, and through a tradition of timidity, those two texts have found their ways 
into translation of the Bible ever since the King James and beyond especially, even though now modern scholars would say most likely these two passages at the end of Mark and the middle of John do not belong in our Greek New Testaments. Now, if we get rid of the long ending of Mark's Gospel where you have the disciples being told that they will be able to pick up snakes and uh, not uh, die if they get bit, uh, they can drink poison and they won't die, uh, there's other things, they'll be speaking in foreign tongues, this kind of thing. Uh, it looks as if to some people this means that this is a cardinal truth of the Christian faith and if we get rid of that we've got a problem. However, it, what, what really has happened with Mark's Gospel is uh, the later editor for those 12 verses who added that to Mark's Gospel did it very early on, early in the second century, got it most likely uh, from the book of Acts and then s from some material out of Luke and Matthew because we read about how Paul was bit by a snake and he didn't die and uh, th those sorts of things. There was early church tradition about uh, some other issues that probably mm -hmm. crept into that ending of Mark's Gospel. But there really is no essential Christian belief that's in those 12 verses that is at stake, that if you remove those verses, you lose it. If you keep those verses, you have it. And, and a careful reading of this is going to reveal that pretty plainly. What's interesting is that the story of the woman caught in adultery in John 8 is a passage that if you talk to the average uh, group of uh, Christians, they would say, if I had to choose between these two passages, Mark 16 and John 8, which one would you want to keep in the Bible and which one would you want to get rid of? Almost uh, unanimously, they will say, I want the story of the woman caught in adultery in the Bible and uh, John, uh, Mark 16, 9 through 20 out. And the reason they do is because there's more emotional baggage attached to that. Here's a wonderful story about the forgiveness that Jesus expresses towards this woman. And uh, it's the kind of a thing that uh, Christians over the centuries have said, this is what Jesus is really like. Now, the question I would raise there is, first of all, do we not see Jesus showing compassion and mercy and forgiveness elsewhere in the Gospels? Do we have to have this passage in order to see that? That's the first question I would ask. But the other question, which is a more important one, is this. When you actually compare the data externally and internally, that is the manuscripts, the, the ancient versions, the patristic writers, and then look at what's going on in terms of the language and the style and how that paragraph fits into the narrative of that gospel. What's interesting is that the long ending of Mark's gospel emerges as having better credentials of authenticity than the story of the woman caught in adultery. Better credentials by far. And yet most scholars would say neither passage is authentic, but if they had to choose on the basis of the scholarly evidence, they would say far and away the story of the woman caught in adultery is going to have to get the hatchet. And I would call it my favorite passage that's not in the Bible, but it is nevertheless one that doesn't communicate anything that we don't already have uh, in Scripture. So keep in mind that there's emotional baggage with a lot of these texts, and yet no essential belief of Christians is impacted by any of these viable variants. There's one other passage that has made the rounds in the last few years as a potential text uh, that would affect uh, orthopraxy, orthodoxy, at least in terms of how Christians practice their faith and their view of a certain issue. It's not an issue that is relevant to the cardinal beliefs that Christians would claim are in the scriptures, but it is a very important issue to half the people in the church, namely women. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 and 35, Paul says, I don't permit a woman to speak in the church uh, because women must keep silent. And uh, then he goes on and says, this tradition we have in the other churches, and uh, just as the law says, uh, this is what women must do. Now, about 15 years ago, 1995, a scholar discovered a very interesting phenomenon for that passage. He noticed that a very early manuscript from the fourth century Codex Vaticanus had two horizontal dots in the margin right above that text at verse 33. And uh, what, what he discovered is that, uh, at least as far as he was able to put this together, those double dots indicated that the scribe recognized a textual variant at the following uh, section, the following two verses. And he surmised that that textual variant was that uh, in some manuscripts known to the scribe in the fourth century, verses 34 and 35 were not part of the text of 1 Corinthians.
Uh, another scholar picked up on this and some others, and there's been quite a bit of dialogue uh, uh, since on this whole discussion. There are some scholars today who would say, even though we have zero manuscript testimony to the effect that these two verses are athetized or excised from any copy of 1 Corinthians in existence, those two dots in the margin tell us that they must have been in some manuscripts in the fourth century. Then another scholar wrote back, a fellow by the name of uh, Jeffrey Miller, and he wrote an article dealing with those uh, double dots as well. And um, what he discovered was that they don't represent uh, a textual variant for the verse before, but only for that line that it's uh, uh, dealing with. And he did a little bit of pushback on, on uh, this original piece by Phil Payne. So there's been some really fascinating dialogue on this. And finally, Dr. Peter Head of Cambridge University in 2009 argued, regardless of what the dots mean, they aren't from the fourth century. They're from several centuries later, like the 15th century. And so he hasn't gotten that article published yet, but there's been really interesting dialogue about this. What this means at bottom is this. Even if there are no manuscripts that would say, uh, let the women uh, be, keep silent in the churches, in other words, there's none that deny that, that omit those two verses, uh, there are some scholars and some very reputable scholars who would say those two verses are not authentic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you've got the evidence so far has been rather scanty, a couple of dots in the margin and uh, those dots have been interpreted in three or four different ways in terms of the date when they were written as, and as to what they uh, discuss. Finally, when you look at this issue, the bottom line question is this. Does this affect a cardinal belief of Christians? And the role of women obviously is a, a hot button issue, a very important issue that uh, uh, Christians especially need to deal with and how they relate to what uh, Paul is saying on this. But it is not something that affects the essence of the Christian faith. It is not a cardinal doctrine. It's not part of the creeds that the church has always embraced. Uh, but it's uh, uh, one in which there's quite a bit of emotional baggage, and rightly uh, so for that. But, but that's it.